I joined 451 about a year and a half ago. I'm part of the Data Center Services and Infrastructure Group over there. And I was asked to speak here to bring a little bit of data center magic into the conversation. We talk a lot about telcos. The uh, question that was posed to me was, well, what does network transformation mean at the data center level? What are they doing about it? So I'm going to talk about something that we're calling software programmable interconnection. I'll start by telling you what I mean by that. But it's basically about the, it's basically about the idea of data centers uh, uh, connecting to one another and in, 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 into a fabric. And the point I really want to make is what data centers want to do about this. So this isn't going to be so much a technology talk as a talk about what SDN has become. I mean, I've been covering it for a long time. I remember the days when we used to, to talk about the, the intensely complicated things you would be able to do with the network. This is a pretty simple use case, but it's nice to know that some of this technology we've been following for all this time has manifested itself into something useful. So the data center operators do see a new business opportunity out of this. I'll talk about a little bit about why that's new to them and then about what it means for some of the other players in the ecosystem. So software programmable interconnection, it's, it's a new term. Uh, Dan Thompson at 451 uh, made it up with me. And I know, I know inventing a new term and a new acronym means that the evil and entropy in the world goes up by one. God kills a puppy every time you make a new acronym. But Dan and I each had different reasons for wanting to do this. For me, covering the data centers, after covering Telus for so long, you have to understand something about the vernacular they use. They've taken to use the term SDN for pretty much anything that involves automation and the network. Any kind of software has become SDN to them. So in my reports, I kept writing the phrase SDN or network virtualization. I got tired of doing that. Dan proposed that we come up with a different term, and that seemed like a good way to encapsulate the idea that some kind of software automation is happening to the network that might or might not be SDN. Also, I wanted to distinguish what's happening inside the data center from what's happening outside, because SPI, inside the data center, it's pretty much a given that they would like to, to virtualize that. And most, most of them have come pretty far along with doing that. They want to be able to control the networks with software. It's the idea of taking that, that concept, that control outside the data center that we found interesting. Now, Dan Thompson had a, a different reason for wanting to create a term here, because he's covered data centers for a long time, and what he sees happening is a, a, a new phase of business for them, a, a, a different way that the data center operators are talking about themselves. So to figure out why it's different, let's talk about how they normally talk about themselves. When I say data centers, I'm not talking about the public clouds. I'm not talking about the enterprise data center to the extent that that still exists. I'm talking about third-party data centers, a multi-tenant data center where lots of different companies are able to come in, rent some space, and plant racks of their own infrastructure there. They, data center operators have to understand technology, and they have some very good expertise in technology, but they're not really technology companies. They're real estate companies. The largest of them are real estate investment trusts. So in tax terms and legal terms, they are literally real estate companies. This is most obvious when you look at the wholesale data center model. They are in the business of selling what I call big empty spaces. I mean, they do more than that. They also have to provide enough power to power racks and racks of equipment. They have to provide uh, the physical security, uh, things like double doors and fingerprint readers and, and walls thick enough that you can't drive a truck through them. I mean, literally, these are, these are parts of their business model. But at the end of the day, they do have to have that big empty space. That's their selling point, that in the proper location, they have enough space to house a large infrastructure deployment. And digital realty is one of the canonical examples of a wholesale data center operator. Contrast with the, that with the retail model, which is probably what you pictured in your head when I first started saying data centers. This is where you have lots and lots of tenants who are in separate cages. They're all in the same building, but they're physically separated from one another. Or in some cases, they might be sharing a cage because some of them are renting out only one rack or a fraction of a rack. The retail model also tends to be a little more hands-on. So they'll have technicians on site in a lot of cases, and these guys can, with your permission, these guys can go into your cage and, and swap out equipment or upgrade equipment, plug things in and out, depending on what you tell them to do. Uh, whereas with wholesale, you're, you tend to be more on your own. In fact, the wholesale tenants kind of prefer it that way. Equinix is the largest of the data center operators. I'm going to be mentioning them a lot. Um, they are the, the prime example of the retail data center model. 
And one interesting thing to note, kind of a side note, is that the two models are starting to blur. Uh, Digital Realty some years ago went out and acquired Telex. They just bought a retail data center operator. And they're getting that retail model infused more and more tightly with their overall corporate identity. Equinix, on the other hand, uh, has opened up a hyperscale uh, division, the hyperscale infrastructure team, where they're building out the big empty spaces and they're hoping to attract uh, the public cloud to them, AWS, Azure, those kinds of folks. So one of the services you can get from inside a data center is to connect to the other people inside the data center. This is one of the attractions. When you mention this kind of interconnection to someone who's an old school data center person, the first thing that'll, that'll come to mind for them is internet peering, where you would interconnect, large entities would interconnect for the sake of exchanging large amounts of traffic. But interconnection is starting to get used in, in more ways for more customers and more kinds of services. And the reason why is kind of the obvious, it's because the enterprise is going to the cloud. Uh, what used to be the enterprise data center might now be a, a a uh, co-location tendency inside of someone else's data center. Uh, what, what the different functions an enterprise used to do have been pushed outward to the clouds, to AWS and Azure. Uh, don't forget SaaS providers. If an if, if, uh, uh, enterprise is using Salesforce for something, they're technically connecting to a cloud. So all of enterprise IT has moved out to a cloud. The number of things an enterprise has to connect to has moved outward. What this means for the enterprise user, so from the standpoint of the, the guy sitting behind a, a laptop trying to, to do normal work in a normal enterprise, is that the internet has, the, the enterprise network has moved out that way too. Whatever they thought of as the enterprise LAN or enterprise WAN is basically internet connections to all these, these different properties. So in a sense, the, inter, the network ought to be considered as being distributed or, or rented out the same way that, that uh, the rest of the infrastructure has been. But a lot of enterprises don't really think of it that way. The, the other thing that's happening is, uh, so yes, you can connect to all the clouds over the internet, and that, that's been one of the appeals. But as more and more mission critical stuff gets into the cloud, enterprises are starting to get, inter get interested in having private connectivity to the cloud. They don't want to trust everything to the internet. And that's where a service like AWS Direct Connect comes into play. It offers a dedicated and private connection that will get you into AWS without having to traverse the internet and, and risk the vagaries of that. So here's what the data center guys are saying about all that. Here's their pitch. If the enterprise has to connect to all of these different things, and if one by one these different connections might change to different kinds of private connections or different kinds of dedicated services, well, the data center operator says, why don't you do it this way? All these things you want to connect to are already connected to our data centers. Right? AWS has some presence in, in different, different retail data centers. Uh, certainly Salesforce does. In fact, if you extend this argument a little bit, if, if more enterprises start co-locating inside of, of data centers, uh, your suppliers might be there too. And maybe there are ways that you could create new services, new transactions, new ways of doing business by opening parts of your network to your suppliers. The, the mirror image of that would be that you, you could access your, your customers this way too. And don't forget that the typical enterprise is spread out. They have multiple branch offices in different places. If all those branch offices are connecting through data centers, maybe the data center can be the heart of that network, they, they, the heart of that kind of connectivity. So the pitch from the data center operators is, Hey, enterprise, come and co-locate with us. You know, rent out your own little cage and your own little space. And with virtual cross-connect, because remember, SDN and network virtualization is happening all over the inside of the data center. With easy virtual cross-connect, we can connect you to all this stuff. The data center would then become kind of like a grand central station for enterprise interconnection. Now, here's the flaw with the grand central station analogy. Grand Central Station obviously is one place, one physical place. It's not going to do me any good when I go home, when I drive home in San Jose here tonight. Likewise, any one data center might not connect to everything that you want to connect to. So here's where the software programmable interconnection part comes in, the, the magic of SDN. By the way, if, if you're a, 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 like a deep technological SDN scientist, prepare to be underwhelmed. This is about connecting point A to point B and then kind of stopping. But the idea is that Grand Central Station is not the, any one data center. It's the fleet of data centers. 
So this is a picture meant to illustrate the Equinix ECX fabric. I'm get, I mentioned Equinix in this talk a lot, by the way. I want to point out that many, many data center operators are, are trying to follow this kind of plan. It's just that Equinix has been at it the longest. They, have, they are the farthest along. They have the, the grandest fabric of all of them, the most data centers. And because of all of that, Equinix is the easiest one to steal art from when you're making your PowerPoint slides. So the point is that once you're, the point is that Equinix has been busy networking up all of its fabrics. They've done this region by region. So in the Americas, most of their data centers have been connected to one another through the magic of SDN. Uh, the same for Europe and same for Asia Pacific. And earlier this year, they finally completed the, uh, the, the wraparound links, if you want to call it. They finally connect, connected the three regions to one another. So the Equinix ECX fabric now spans the globe. This is not a picture of the whole fabric, by the way. This is just a diagram to suggest what it's doing. I should also point out it does not include every single Equinix uh, data center facility. They say that that's the goal, but realistically, I'm not sure it ever will. There will always be one brand new data center that hasn't quite fit into the fabric. Anyway, the, the point is, from the point of view of the customer, Equinix will offer a, a self-service portal. And if you're sitting in a place like San Francisco, say you've got a, a huge far-flung enterprise with presences in major cities everywhere, if you're sitting in San Francisco, you could use this portal to create a connection from your London office to your Singapore office, for example, and do it within minutes, have this thing pop up pretty much automatically. Uh, th this would also help if your, if your London office needs to reach some service or some cloud that, for whatever reason, is only reachable through the Singapore uh, Equinix facility. That's where this would come in handy. So that's the idea. Equinix has been proposing this for, for years now. They've been pushing it pretty hard from a marketing standpoint. Other data, like I said, other data center operators are, are talking about doing this, but they're at varying stages of success with it, or varying stages of completion. A lot of them are just starting out. The problem I think they're going to run into, all of them, is trying to convince enterprises of this story. Because the logic of the story kind of holds together, but a lot of enterprises don't know very much about co-location, don't really consider themselves to be in the market for that for a co-location kind of service. And in fact, a lot of them are still trying to figure out which fractions of their business they want in the cloud or not in the cloud. So they're still trying to figure out the cloud problem itself. This is the connectivity problem that comes after you've really established your cloud plan. So it's going to be a tough road. It's, it's a new market for them. But this is, like I said, a new phase of business for them, something that they uh, They've started talking about that's very different from their normal real estate kinds of conversations. So having explained that part and software programmable interconnection, I want to talk about the implications for a couple of the other members of the ecosystem. The first time I got shown a diagram like this by Equinix, uh, my question was, well, you, you see all those double lines that represent long haul connections between major cities, wasn't that the purview of service providers? And aren't service providers and telcos kind of losing out on this a little bit? The argument that the data center operators will put forth for you is that no, the service providers still have a role to play in this. So I'll just toss this out there and you can see what you think of it. Uh, first of all, everything I've talked about with connectivity assumes that you start inside the data center. I've been talking about connecting one data center to some service someplace else. Well, nobody lives inside the data center, so you have to connect into the data center somehow, and that's gonna be the job of whatever service provider you're using right now. It's, it's, it's gonna be an ISP or whatever MPLS connection you've got now. So that relationship stays in place. Second, the, all these long haul connections, most of the data center operators have no interest in owning fiber. They're, they're leasing it from, from elsewhere. I mean, I, I guess Colt, which is, is kind of pursuing this model too, they want to own their own fiber in metro areas, but most of them really don't want to be in that business. So that's a role that some kind of service provider can play as well. But finally, uh, uh, the most compelling argument why this shouldn't be a problem to the service providers is that service providers can be customers of this kind of fabric. The predecessor to Equinix's ECX fabric was called the Equinix Cloud Exchange, and its job was to uh, basically connect you, the enterprise, to a cloud on-ramp someplace. It was, it was made for services like AWS Direct Connect. And what's happened is service providers have become some of the biggest customers of that service. What they do is, is they 
essentially resell it. They, they, they offer it to their customers as a service, but ride the, ECA, the uh, Equinix fabric to get there. So that's a way that they can participate as well. They can make use of this fabric. Personally, I, I still look at all this and can't, with 2020 hindsight, I know, but I, I can't help but wonder if there shouldn't have been a bigger role for telcos in this world. If this is the way things really turn out and enterprises need all this connectivity everywhere, maybe telcos could have found a, a better way to participate in this, but we'll see. They've become the over-the-top provider. they become the, yes, yes. The, the, the example I just talked about, the telco is the over-top the top provider. Yeah. It, it's, it's ironic and maybe a hard pill to swallow, <laughs> depending on your point of view. I would be remiss if I did not mention that there are non-data center operators who have been doing this software programmable interconnection um, thing already. Uh, some of them started earlier than most of the data center providers, in fact. I've, I've listed them up here as aggregators. That's a word that I've seen 451 used to describe them. Network as a service providers would be another pretty accurate way to say it, but network as a service is used for a lot of other things too. I'm talking about companies like Megaport and Epsilon uh, coming out of Australia and Singapore, um, and each one with a global reach now. Uh, Packet Fabric, primarily here in the US. Uh, the former console, the piece of console that got owned by uh, PCCW, I think they do this kind of thing too. These companies don't own data centers. Their job is to con provide the connectivity between data centers. So Megaport, for example, has gone around the world setting up points of presence in different people's data centers, and their service is the network connectivity between these points. And they do this in a very, quote unquote, SDN kind of way, a very software programmable interconnection kind of way. They offer self-service portals. Customers are able to, to create their own connections um, around the entire Megaport network uh, uh, as they desire, and, and the connections come up pretty quickly, within minutes. This might sound like it would clash a little bit with the, the whole data center fabric model I just talked about, but it's really been symbiotic so far. In fact, uh, if you look at Digital Realty specifically, they're a worldwide data center operator. When you use their data center fabric, which is called Service Exchange, it's literally just Megaport. Digital Realty has partnered with Megaport openly, and the two of them are working together to help develop this fabric. Hello. So it's Megaport's connectivity that you're writing, even though you might buy the service from Digital Realty. The other reason the data center operators are okay with this is because of the idea of tethering. So I've got a picture with no words. I'm going to attempt to walk my way through this. Hopefully this will make sense. But the idea is that, look, if you look at one of these data center fabrics, particularly Equinix, they are closed universes. Equinix is SDN fabric, if you will, uh, only connects to Equinix facilities. So in this example, you, you take a look at the green enterprise up there toward the top. Say that's in Cleveland. Equinix doesn't have any facilities in Cleveland. So if these guys want to be part of the Equinix fabric, or if they, or more specifically, if Equinix wants them to be able to participate, they need some way to connect into an Equinix facility. And this is where something like Megaport would come in. The, the two rectangles that say aggregator node, pretend those are Megaport. We'll just use Equinix and Megaport as our example here. The uh, enterprise in Cleveland can, hop, can establish a presence in a data center that's more local to them, maybe, one, maybe a place where they already had a presence, and they can just ride a megaport to go into the uh, Equinix facility, which is the larger one on the bottom, and from there tap all the different services that are available through Equinix connectivity, which sounds great, right? That's a nice symbiotic um, kind of... Uh, kind of use case. Since I've got a couple minutes, let me explain the same diagram again, but in a way that kind of bugs Equinix. In example number two, instead of Cleveland, say that enterprise is in Los Angeles. Equinix does have a facility in Los Angeles. They very much do. But Equinix costs a lot. So say you're in this enterprise and you just don't want to pay that much to Equinix. Well, maybe you go to Bob's Data Center Emporium or someplace else that's in Los Angeles where Megaport has a presence. You establish yourself there, and then through Megaport, you buy connectivity to, I don't know, AWS Direct Connect or, or different services that are all the way out in Singapore. You do the London to Singapore thing, but you do all of this without paying any of the co-location costs to Equinix. That kind of tethering exists, too. This is happening. Uh, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing is still kind of up in the air. Uh, a lot of these 
services are kind of new enough that they're still feeling out how the, the business models for these things are going to work. Equinix tries to structure its pricing. First of all, I should say Equinix keeps its pricing pretty secret, uh, but they try to structure their pricing to make this look a little bit less attractive, especially if you're a large enterprise. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, sometime in the future Equinix starts trying to levy some kind of tax or, or find some way to get uh, more of what it considers its fair share out of this kind of use case. I keep mentioning Equinix, so this is my guilt slide. This is other random data centers who are talking about software programmable interconnection. Actually, originally the slide was going to be a contrast between the SDN and not so SDN guys, and it was the title was going to be I'm more SDN than you, like I'm more metal than you. But then I was going to have to find a picture, and that was not going to go well. So random variations on SDN and SPI. Some of them really are doing SDN. So, so I, I, we made up this SPI term, but some of these companies are doing honest to goodness SPN. Uh, CoreSight and CoLogix, both North American data center providers, are using Sienna Blue Planet. So there you go, real brand name kind of SDN. Uh, Packet Fabric, the, the network as a service company that was, is in Megaport's ballpark, they're also using an SDN controller, but they built their own. It's based on open daylight. They just didn't, they, they weren't, com they started fairly early and they weren't really comfortable with the commercial offerings that, that were available at the time. Same thing is kind of true for QTS. They are a provider that has data centers only in the United States, and they wanted to do this software programmable interconnection thing. Their hangup was that they wanted their SDN to integrate very, very tightly with their billing system. Because as you create these connections on demand, they actually make alterations to the, the, the billing and contract systems. They needed everything to basically tie into their OSS and BSS, and they decided it was going to work better if they just built it themselves. One thing about this um, SPI term, software programmable interconnection, that I should mention, um, it's really meant to, to, uh, to, 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 to represent the connectivity of a whole fleet of data centers. So QTS doesn't quite count as software programmable interconnection because they're a US provider, right? If you want to link two data center presences that are on opposite sides of the country, they don't want to do that. They're going to just refer you to packet fabric. So they're, not, they're, they're using SDM, but they're not quite using it for the SPI case. We're going to be really pedantic about this since we made up the term. Uh, same is true for Sixterra. They're, they are the uh, former CenturyLink data center arm. And um, if you want to connect things between two Sixterra facilities that are very far apart, they won't do it for you. They want to refer you to a service provider. Um, they have a more pragmatic reason. Service providers are some of their biggest customers, one in particular, and they don't want to alienate those guys. Sixterra, by the way, is the one example on the slide is very much not SDN. Their, their, their software, their interconnection automation is just automated layer two scripts. Um, little VX LAN tunnels, I think. I think Megaport is, is the same. It's just simple automated scripting. So that's the uh, SDN view from the data center side. Uh, the idea is that the, this, this concept of being able to create uh, connections very quickly and, and let users do it themselves uh, within minutes, it's new to them. And they're finding new, new avenues of business for it. They particularly want to use this to help fuel their drive to bring more enterprises into the co-location business. It's, it's still developing. Uh, most of the data center operators are still in the early stages of this, and we'll have to see how successful they are with it. Thanks. Alan, the clock says 36 seconds. Well, I want to add on to what Dan says. I liked reading your material, but now I can't do it anymore because you have to have a subscription to the 451 to read your material, it's not in the clear. I had a very interesting trip to CoreSight. In fact, I'm organizing an IEEE tour there, tour there at the end of the month, and I asked them about implementing something like the Equinix Cross Connect. No, we have no intentions of doing that, not within our data center, not to link our data centers. We don't want to get involved in that. We don't have the skill set. We cannot maintain that. Okay. 
That sort of conflicts with what you said about the Blue Planet. He did not mention Blue Planet. He did say they were having some trouble with Sienna optical gear, which hurt me because I worked for Sienna <laughs> for three years. But um, the, um, the other thing he said was of interest. They have 11 different network operators <coughs> that have brought fiber to their core site dentist, data center. That blew me away. And he said their customers much prefer those network operators to do the aggregation for them. Each network operator takes all of the data traffic that their colo customers generate or receive and aggregates it and then sends it off to wherever, to a cloud provider that they have an arrangement with, mm -hmm. to a VPN, to the public internet or whatever. They say their customers provide it and their, this is important, and their customers get the security they need. They would not get the security they need if CoreSight would be providing such interconnections either within the data center or data center interconnect. Okay. Have any comment on that? Okay, no, good point. Uh, Good point about CoreSight not fabricating up their data centers. I got a little over-enthusiastic with that slide. I should point out I had CoreLogix up there, too, and they have not done this yet, either. They are both using Sienna Blue Planet and some... my knowledge, there's no Blue Planet in CoreSight Santa Clara. None. Maybe not in Santa Clara. They, they are a partner of Sienna's. They are a customer of Blue Planet, so they have some plan to do something with it. Yeah, that, that was a case of me getting over-enthusiastic with the slide. Like I said, it started out as a uh, comparison of SDN and not-so-SDN, so... I started it off with the, uh, the Sienna Blue Planet well, partners. Comment, right. um, I take they don't yeah. want to get involved in it because they, they, they don't have the skill set, they can't maintain it, and they can't give them the security they need. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I mean, Equinix is, is a larger company with a, a larger um, fleet of technicians. So that implies if it, that only the big COLA holes can do this like Equinix. No, nah, QTS is pretty small. They, they want to do this too. It implies that CoreSight doesn't want to do it. They might change their minds if the fabric idea is successful for Equinix. Yeah. Any other yeah. questions? Yes. Yeah. Sir, I had a couple of questions. So do you have any idea, like they've been doing this ECX, and I've been hearing about it, especially from the cloud exchange. Is there any, I mean, what's the take rate on this? Are they able to actually get their customers to buy into this and use that as a service? And the other thing is the point that you know uh, Alan was making, which is, I mean, presumably then they have uh, the expert network ex expertise to do this because traditionally they just have techs who are you know putting your gear in their data center, who are not necessarily doing this kind of you know software-based network setup. So does Equinix now have a whole sort of networking team? I mean, I know they do; they are a big operator mm -hmm. of data centers, but I mean that's a new skill set that they have to acquire. So. They've obviously committed to do that? Or? Okay, yeah, I, I think they have. I, I couldn't name any of the people in it. I uh, couldn't, couldn't tell you specifics about it. Equinix is pretty secretive. It's not the same, it, this is not being run by, the, the fabric wouldn't be run by the same people who are walking in and replacing your servers sure, or sure. plugging sure. cables into things. They, yeah, they yeah. did have to recruit, uh, they, they would have to recruit. Uh, I mean, you need a network engineering team to do this. Yeah, you'd have to recruit network yeah. engineers. You need, you'd probably need some kind of layer three expertise. Yeah, it, it, it is beyond what they normally do. Yeah, okay. uh, They are aware of that, yeah. Okay. As for the take rate, I, I, I can't remember if they mentioned that on their earnings calls. Other than that, I wouldn't know. Okay. Um, they don't really okay. talk about it. And then for ECX, you I mean, they, I guess this would be standard policy. I just don't know it. But they would have some kind of catalog where you would know who's who's in which data center mm -hmm. of, of the distributed data center fabric, and then you know how to connect to them, and yeah. you can make a choice. Yeah, they would expose that to you. Okay, so, cool. Yeah.